So before we get going, some of you may also have been following our Instagram story where we have the doll showdown. We've been running it for two weeks, a head to head with some of the dolls from the collection. And uh, we're down to four final contestants, although we're pretty sure one of them is out of the running. But before I introduce the four finalists, I would like to introduce the one that I wanted to win, and that's this little guy. I believe his name is Clarence. He's a reproduction of a Shackman doll. Shackman was a company in New York City. I just like Clarence's style right down to his velvet pants. He's quite a guy and he's got some pretty cool shades on. Clarence was out of the running very early in the day. I'm not even sure if he was in the running. Anyway, so now we're down to two finalists. Tiny Swingy. Tiny Swingy is a doll that can dance and move her head apparently. She has a battery pack in the back. Of course, we haven't tried it. Tiny Swingy is head to head against a more elaborate competitor. It's this doll here, she's a little bit bigger. This is a Lency doll. Lency was a company in Italy that made felt pressed dolls. Their uh, trademark for their dolls was all their dog dolls looked sideways. They, they were always giving everybody the stink eye. Apparently Lency is not doing as well as Tiny Swingy. Tiny Swingy is a little friendlier. However, there's still hope for Lency. Then we have Skippy in his dapper little outfit. Skippy is a F and B doll. F and B was a company from the States. And Skippy is head to head against Ben. Ben, <laughs> he's got a floppy hat. They both have pretty natty suits. Ben is a, um, a doll from Germany made by a company that has a specific trademark. If you want to find out more about Ben and Skippy, you can look at our online doll exhibit. We have more information about their makers and whatnot. So you're not too late. It's pretty clear that Ben is going to be out of the running, which I don't mind because I really like Skippy. But anyway, you are, you are still able to vote as of today and tomorrow for the finalists in our doll showdown. Maybe you can take those ones. Thank you. Miggy, Miggy is my able assistant because I don't have much room on this table for all the dolls. So he's going to be helping me out. When he gets back, we'll get him to give a cameo. And uh, the other thing I wanted to show you is the scale of some of our dolls. This one over there, please, Miggy. Come over and say hello. Uh, I'm introducing my assistant here, Mr. Miguel Ferreira. We know him as Miggy. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so now I'm going to talk about the size of the dolls because on our doll exhibit, it's hard to tell the scale of the dolls because we haven't provided a ruler for scale. However, one of our coworkers was astonished to find out that Sleepy Sydney here is this small. I guess she envisioned him as one of the baby dolls that you could hold in your arms and carry. This is Sleepy Sydney. He's made out of a bisque head, paper mache arms, and a cloth body. We also have Dolores. I'm trying to get it so there's no glare on there. Dolores is a dancing doll. We, don't, we don't, haven't taken her out of the box recently, but she spins around and can dance. On the other side of the scale, there's the Lency doll that I showed you, who is quite large. And we also have Betty Bright. And Betty Bright is quite large. Speaking of large, this is probably a good time to introduce my co-host here, Bernice. Bernice just happened to be around. I have give her a little wig adjustment. She's fairly stern looking, Bernice, but we've given her a doll to soften her. So maybe by the end of the program, she'll have gotten over her other doll envy. Now, oh, and here's another little small guy. This guy in the collection, someone cataloged it years ago and the cataloging information said small man, brown pants. So he's become something of a fixture in the museum conversations. This is small man, brown pants. He was made by the Louis Marx company in New York City. He's got bendable arms. He was, um, the, he was one of a series and there was a group of dolls made around by the company and they were the um, Wild West family. And I just got this girl out because I like her. She's a nurse. Looks like her arms are kind of long for her body, but she has the old nurse's 
head covering. She just has a nice little face. She's from the 1920s and she's plastic. So those are the size discrepancies and the size discrepancy is something that we have to deal with at museums as far as storage goes and we also have to take into consideration things like the the, uh, the condition of the dolls the materials they're made of and how fragile they are so i have a bunch of dolls on the side here and using these i'm going to show you some of the materials that our dolls are made of and also some of the ways they are constructed now this is a peg wooden. This is also a, a Shackman head. I don't know for sure if the body is a Shackman body. A lot of doll companies just made the heads and then shipped them out to companies who then provided the bodies. These peg woodens were, are significant because Queen Victoria had a very large collection of these dolls. She loved them above all the other dolls apparently. And these were very popular in Germany and Holland. And of course she had a Germanic background. So this is a peg wooden, fairly rudimentary construction. Perhaps you could make one, any hardware store. So there's a peg wooden with a china head. This is an Eros doll. These are dolls that were in direct con competition with the Lency dolls. They were also made from a pressed felt, not quite the same quality as the Lency dolls, but they also imitated the sidelong look. You'd think they'd have come up with their own gimmick, but I guess they thought that was a good one, so they made all their dolls look sideways as well. So that's an Eros doll from Italy made out of felt. And these were popular. They were made with lots of different costumes to represent the different regional costumes in Europe over the years. Thanks, Maggie. And this one is a reproduction doll, China doll, with a cloth body. And she's got quite a little outfit on. So there was a company called the Mark Farmer Company and they would produce uh, the heads and legs and feet, heads and legs and arms of China dolls. And they often used antique patterns to create them. And then they shipped them out in do-it-yourself packages for people to make their own dolls. And this is a similar kind of thing. There's a China doll. Those ones, of course, you have to be very careful how you store them. This is a doll with sleep eyes which means when you tip her over, her eyes close. Most people have seen those. I like her because she's kind of wild looking. Her hair has seen better days. Her outfit is pretty wild. She's all plastic. Plastic has to be stored in a specific way. But the other thing about the sleep eyes is it's recommended that when you're storing dolls with sleep eyes that you store them face down like this in order to keep the mechanism from wearing out the in order to keep the mechanism from wearing out. This one is a Reliable doll. Reliable was a Canadian company. She could be a Lency doll though. She's looking sideways. Now this is uh, a doll that's seen better days. Her, his, his or her cape has come off, but he has a bisque head made by the Armand Marche company in Germany from the turn of the century roughly. There's the Armand Marche mark, the AM, and then there's usually a mold number. And quite often you'll find baby dolls from different companies with very similar heads because they bought them from the Armand Marche, Armar, Armand Mars, I'm getting it mixed up, <laughs> Armand Marche company. And so you can see how similar these two are. And this one is also an Armand, oh no, this one isn't an Armand Marche but they're very similar, right down to the backs of their heads. And they have both, one of them has a cloth body and one of them has a bisque or a composition body. Composition is a material that is made out of wood particles and pressed into a hard shape. And it creates a doll that looks like this one. Thanks, Maggie. So this doll who's flipped her wig, has uh, a bisque head, which bisque is a kind of china, but it's not finished with the same shine. It has a more realistic skin texture and a composite body, which is the pressed wooden stuff. And this is a good example of some of the, and you can see it, the feet, what it's like, where it's starting to wear away. This is a good example of one of the ways the doll's legs are hinged. hinged. This one has the ball and socket type. So the ball of the knee fits into the socket of the upper leg. And 
heads were also made either it's the ball and socket style or the shoulder and that included the shoulder that came down to about here and then the body was attached to that. This little doll has the bisque head and she has a leather body. And if you look at her leather body, they had a clever way to make her movable. They put a gusset in the back of the leg, they put a gusset in the knee and she can bend her legs back and forth. Her bisque head was made by, well, it doesn't say, but this is another one that has the shoulder construction. So it attaches to the top of the leather body. Some dolls have real hair, real, I mean, real human hair. Some dolls have mohair, some dolls, most dolls nowadays have synthetic hair. This doll is made out of cloth, but also wax. So her head, she's got a shoulder style head made of wax. Her lower legs are made of wax and her lower arms are made of wax. So she was painted after she was molded and then attached to a cloth body like so. You can see the attachment there. And of course, a wax doll is gonna require some specific care. You don't wanna put it near the heater and you also don't want to drop it and scuff it. So it's quite remarkable that this doll is in such good shape. I believe it dates to roughly turn of the century. And she also has real human hair. And if you look closely at her scalp, you can see where the hair was injected into the scalp. Maybe you can see that. So that is a wax doll with real human hair. It's a pretty incredible facial painting to make it look so realistic, especially on the eyes. You can take that one, thanks, Mickey. This one has a composition head and a cloth body with pretty basic joints at the legs and composition arms attached to a cloth body. This one's got a fairly sweet face. I believe this is, uh, yeah, and this is a Reliable doll from the Reliable Company of Canada. These were really popular dolls in the 30s, 40s, mm -hmm. and on into the 50s, I believe, was when they ended up. I like this little doll. She's also got a very sweet face, and she also is a reliable head on a cloth body. She's seen some better days. I don't know what happened to her, but somebody played with her a lot. But the other thing about this one is she has legs made of what is called magic skin. We have a few dolls in the collection with this magic skin. It's a vinyl and it's stuffed with cotton batten. So it's got a lifelike texture when you hold it. So she had magic skin legs, composition head, and a cloth body and a sweet face. Although she looks like she has cat whiskers there, doesn't she? And last but not least of that group, I will show you this girl. She has slightly different connectors for her legs. They're like a metal disc that fits in to the hip. I don't know if you can see that or not. I'm gonna have to untie one arm, I think, so you can see the connector. And uh, she's fairly fragile, so I've mounted her on a backboard, more or less, to keep her from falling apart. But there you can see the, the connector for her legs. I suspect when she was a new doll, that wasn't quite as loose as it was, and it may even have been repaired at some point. The rest of her is all composition. Composition is a substance that is really susceptible to water damage. It's because it is wood, if it gets wet, the wood expands or contracts depending on moisture content in the air or if it gets somebody, well, we have a doll that wets itself and that's really not a very good combination for a composition doll. And so the wood expands or contracts, which causes the surface finish on the dolls to crack. So if you see a doll like that, that's why. I also got this doll out because we have a little bit of a story about this doll. She belonged to, um, what was the lady's name? She belonged to a woman named Annie Shearer from Scotland who received the doll in 1908 then she gave it to her son in 1926, who then subsequently gave it to his daughter when she was born in 1945. 
and it has come to us. So this doll has had a lot of playtime. And I guess it shows in the way her limbs are starting to get limp and her head is wobbly. I like her little moccasins though, although they're a little worn. And sadly, she didn't come with clothes. This is another example of a doll with a, 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 bis or a bisque head, composition body, ball and socket joint, and a velvet dress. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is some dolls that do things. We have, well, dolls that do things have been around for centuries. And there were automatons, which were a little more complicated than dolls. In this book, I have a picture that you can look at of a doll that was created with a bellows in the inside here. And when the bellows was operated, it made the arms move up and down. So that was a, an early attempt at automating a doll. And of course, anyone with an automated doll back in the old days probably was fairly wealthy. Then when they began to mass produce things, dolls became a little cheaper and people had dolls that did things more regularly. Talking dolls were very popular. And in the 60s, I think I had a talking Barbie at one point. This is Tiny Swingy. I already showed you her. She's in the, the running for the big competition. And Tiny Swingy can, she dances. So and when the battery pack is in, she'll twist her head, move her arms up and down and twist at the waist. So a typical 60s dance, I imagine it's fairly mechanical to look at. And Tiny Swingy, uh, she has an on off switch. The battery pack is in her back and she has the on off switch under her hair right there, the little lever that goes back and forth. So if you really like Tiny Swingy, oh, and she's also fairly rigid because of the mechanisms inside her. This is, this is the talking doll. I thought Tiny Swingy was, but I was wrong. Some people who are a little more elderly than some of the young folks around may remember this little girl, Buffy. Buffy was from a popular TV show in the 1960s that I liked to watch when I was young. And she, she and her brother Jody were orphans for some reason or other, and they lived with their uncle who had a butler named Mr. French. So Buffy and Jody had lots of adventures, quite often involved Buffy's doll, Mrs. Beasley. If anything ever happened to Mrs. Beasley, it was a major crisis. So Buffy was sold as a marketing tool for the program and she came with Mrs. Beasley and she had the familiar pull string to make her talk and she had a recording inside her. Um, I'm not gonna pull her string because that uh, is a risk with an artifact. And if you ever owned one of these dolls with the strings, you'll know that if you pull the string, even when they're brand new, there's a risk that you're gonna yank it too hard and then they stop talking and the whole point is moot. They're not so much fun anymore. But there's Buffy and her doll, Mrs. Beasley. This is an old walking doll. This one is also very rigid. When the arm goes up, it kicks one of the legs out. I don't know if you can see that. I think it needs to be on the hard surface, so let's go. Yes, see, she'll do a rudimentary Frankensteinish walk. She's, uh, oh, and she turns her head as well. And she also was a wedding doll. You can see she's got a, or a drinking doll. She's got a hole there to hold baby bottle. And uh, another example of molded hair that I was going to mention earlier, and I didn't. And I think that's all the dolls that do things. The next thing we have are, oh, and this doll does, yeah, this is the crying doll. So this is a doll with a sticker on it that says, Baby Tootsie, a British Empire product. It was also made by Reliable, so the indication of the British Empire gives you an idea of the era that she came from. She is a crying doll. It's really a pathetic cry. It's more of a mule. Here, I'll see if I can get her to do it. There. Can you hear that little mule? <laughs> Perhaps when she was new, she could cry a little more lustier. She's made out of composition and she's had quite a bit of play as well. Her body is cloth. And does she have that? And she has working sleep eyes as well. Now we have this doll. 
Well, this doll is made entirely out of paper mache, except for the head, which is bisque. And you can see she's in fairly fragile condition from having been played with. You can see the seams in the body where she was constructed and rudimentary joint connectors. Whether that's the original, I suspect largely that it's not, but uh, you can see that there's basically something that runs through the body. That's a consideration also in conserving dolls is a lot of dolls have this kind of construction where the legs hook inside to the body and the hooks on the inside are attached by an elastic band. The elastic is prone to deterioration and they snap very easily. But if that happens to you, there are lots of doll conservators who can easily replace that mechanism. So there's this doll. Her feet look like they've been worn down to a nub, like she's been walking for her whole life. Or perhaps she belonged to a, a person like my younger sister who consistently chewed the feet off of all our Barbies. So there she is. And now I have some little curiosities to show you. I have, well, she's not so much curiosity as a as something that everybody recognizes from a certain era anyway, Shirley Temple. And Shirley Temple has got her dainty little coat and outfit complete with her uh, dimples and her ringlets and a tam. But if you look very closely at this Shirley Temple, her eyes are just a tad jaundiced looking. She's seen better days in the eye department. So there's Shirley Temple. We have three Shirley Temples. And if you go to the doll exhibit that's online at the moment, the Uncanny Valley, you will see the three Shirley Temples together. They're different sizes and they all have different outfits. You can take her back to the good ship lollipop. Maybe doesn't get that. <laughs> then I have these two dolls and they have hats. They both have the same hat. And they're virtually identical. They have the same yellow gown. They have the same elaborate hair. They have the same size. Their faces are the same, although this one's eyes seem to be stuck closed at the moment. And the difference between, and there's a slight difference in the mouth and the nose in this one. This one's mouth is a little smaller. But the main difference between these two is one is an original from the Morimura Brothers doll making company in Japan and the other is a reproduction. I'm going to check and then you see if you can guess which one is the original and which one is the Marimura. Marimura or, or Marimura? This is, will the real Marimura step forward? Here she is. She's the Marimura doll. She's the reproduction. The Marimura dolls also have uh, leather bodies. And this one has a slightly different joint on it. It's kind of screwed into the leg like that. And the hip also has the screw for the joint. So there's the two identical dolls. And I believe this one lost her trousers while I was talking. Can't trust a reproduction. That's what I say. There she goes. And this one, these two I have, let me just get my dates handy for these two. We also have these two dolls here. Have you ever yearned for your own nun doll? Well, we have two of them. These are nuns with the original uh, a style of, uh, the, their clothes are made in the style of the original sisters of the child Jesus when they first came to Canada. The style of habit that was worn from 1896 to 1911 is this one. And it has, in this doll, it consists of 17 different pieces. It's got all the parts of the habit. It's got the smock, it's got stockings and shoes and underwear and petticoats and a cape. And it's just really immaculately done. No, no pun there intended. And then we also have the habit style from 1911 to 1948, also from the Sisters of the Child Jesus. And the Sisters of Child Jesus have been in BC since 1896. And they also have a location on Laval Street here in Millardville to this day. In fact, uh, one of the sisters there has donated things to us in the past. So we have these, an appropriate thing for the collection of the museum in Millardville. Two nun dolls, off they go. Thank you, Libby. 
Next things I have to show you are these dolls. They have, I brought them out because they have some beautiful clothing. They have all the pieces that they need, right down to the details of the lace and the piping and the buttons, the, the bustle at the back. They're really nice. So she has a delightful outfit. And then so does this lady. This lady's hat and wig are one piece. But she's got silky pant pantaloons. She's got a frilly dress with lace. She's got moccasins, I believe, if I can see them. Yes, she's got leather moccasins. And there she's flipped her wig. So she has a fancy hat attached to her hair. There's the top of her head. And she has earrings, which is not something you see all the time. So one of the companies that made the dolls, the name escapes me just offhand, but you can read more about it on the web exhibit, made dolls with earrings. And some of those were very un, uh, rare finds for collectors. So I brought those out to introduce some of the costumes. Oh yeah, and not to, not to mention her animal stole. I don't know what kind of creature that is. Miniature fox, perhaps. I hear they're rife these days. So that leads me to talk about doll clothes. And I don't know if my mom is watching today. I think she might be. So no offense, mom, but my mother was not crazy about sewing. She could do it, but she didn't really enjoy it, much like myself. And so we tended to just throw stuff on our dolls and that's what we used for doll clothes and we didn't care. However, some people were luckier. There, um, there was a doll done in, for a raffle during World War I and she had 64 different costumes and the doll was raffled off for proceeds to the war effort. The sad story about that doll, apropos of not too much really, but the sad story about that doll is the girl who won the raffle of the doll on Christmas Eve, her father, who was a train man, was crushed between two cars of the train. This will add a little seriousness to the proceedings. So we have a volunteer, Patricia, who comes in and she helps us with different things. And one of the things she's been doing for us is sewing labels onto some of the, everything in the, in the collection needs to be identified by number. And she was sewing labels onto these doll clothes. And Patricia is a sewer. That's, I finally got around to my point. Patricia's a very good sewer, and she recognized that these were clothes made by someone who was a really good sewer. And these were, in fact, made by, let me get her name handy so don't get it wrong. Her name was, I kept my pages in order. The lady that donated these to us was Dale Piller, and her mother was a good sewer. She was a, actually a professional tailor and she worked for a place called Parisienne in Vancouver. Dale's mother's name was Selma Nee Stebner. And not only did Selma make all of Dale's clothing, but she used the scraps from making Dale's clothing to make clothing for her dolls. And we actually have a picture of Dale with one of her dolls and they're wearing matching dresses. So this collection of doll clothes came from Dale. And this is Dale in the picture. So we have a beautiful flannel pajama set. We have a dress that has had some damage done to it. We have a striped zebra bathing suit. And this is one of my favorites. It's a, well, can you guess what it is? It looks like a handbag. It's not a handbag. It's an evening gown. So the doll would wear the evening gown, the head would be here. It makes me think of uh, Cinderella where Cinderella's coach turns into a pumpkin. Well, Cinderella herself was a pumpkin if she was wearing a dress like this. Not my style, but perhaps in Dale Pillar's day, it looked fancy and enticing. She also made for her a satin underwear set, a small brassiere and underwear with lace trimming, no less, and elastic. She made different suits for them. There's a matching suit here with a skirt and a shirt. This is sort of business attire, I guess. And then we have a whole box full of those. So I brought those out to talk about doll clothing. And that's probably enough of that. We'll put those over there for now. 
But then there's other doll accessories. Oh, and I have this interesting little thing that was supposed to be shown a little earlier. I'll show you this. It's called the wedding of the dolls. So we have this, it was made in Japan, came in this box. And what you see on the cover is what you get inside. So you have everything you need here to make a wedding. You have the church, you have the priest or pastor, you have the, man, the groom and the bride, and you also have the best man and the, what do they call it? Best man and the bridesmaid. <laughs> yeah. So there's the wedding of the dolls. You're a little young by the look of it to me to be getting married, but who am I to say? So that's a little curiosity we have in our collection. But dolls and doll accessories were also, doll accessories are also really interesting. We have some that relate to a different time. This is a washboard for washing clothes. And I dare say not too many little girls today have a washboard accessory for their dolls. So this is for dolls to wash your clothes. We have a doll sized egg beater. Not only may, might they not have an egg beater in their collection, but they might not have a hand operated one. Well, I guess they probably wouldn't have an electric one either for that matter. But this is kind of a nice one. It's got a nice painted wooden handle and that's another doll accessory. What can be in the golden box? Another hat. And I like this doll accessory. Well, it's a doll and an accessory. It's a tin lady pushing a tin baby carriage. But we have lots of other doll accessories in the collection and I didn't bring them all up. When I was a child, it was quite a thing to have a set of dishes for your dolls. My friend and I spent hours and oddly enough, one of the things we enjoyed the most about our doll collection was washing them in her bathtub. We often got into trouble because it always devolved into a water fight, but we have a cup and saucer, this, this goes with that other set. We have a cup and saucer, milk and sugar pitcher, and it's got a little country scene on the side, little red farmhouse, red roofed farmhouse. So we have those. And those are for probably kids like me. But then there was other kids that maybe got this set. This is quite a nice set. And again, mom and dad, no offense. I enjoyed my dishes that I had. So this set has all you need, dishes, platters, teapot, sugar, creamer, a little uh, casserole dish. And I don't know about anybody else, but I was a little girl. I would just enjoy the way they're packed. This one has had some wear because the, the uh, casserole dish lid has been cracked over the years but somebody along the line repaired it and it came to us to show you today so there is that now moving on from that I have a couple of more things to show you I'm going to move Miss Lentzi if you wouldn't mind taking her please Miggy uh, oh and I also was going to mention oh no I did already so I'll leave that there. So I also brought in this book, The Tale of Two Bad Mice by Beatrix Potter. And most of you will have heard of Beatrix Potter and her long series of books that she wrote. On the back of this, there's 23 listed. This one is one of my kids' favorites. And I bring it out because it's about two bad mice, obviously. And the two bad mice come across this dollhouse and they think they've hit a gold mine. So the two mice are Tom and Hunkamunka, and the dollhouse belongs to Lucinda and Jane the dolls. Lucinda and Jane go away, Hunkamunka and Tom break into the dollhouse and basically just wreak havoc. They pull all the feathers out of the feather bed, they empty every canister, and at one point in the story they get really ticked off because the food is fake, so they smash it all up into smithereens. And of course Lucinda and Jane come home and their house is a mess. I use that to introduce to you one of the museum's dollhouses. The one I'm going to show you now is one of three that we have here. This is the smallest of the three. I mentioned the last one in the last Facebook Live and it's upstairs and when the museum's open again, you're going to be able to come in and take a look at that dollhouse. 
it's uh, about as tall as well it's taller than me let's just say that and uh, then the other one is sort of mid-range between that wider than it is tall and then we have this one so Miggy's going to focus on that I think now so we have this lovely dollhouse um, it's got three levels obviously you can see that it's got all these different parts it's got a bathroom here with a bathtub and toilet and it's complete with the towel rack there's a bedroom here i guess this is the foyer when you come up the stairs this must be the library it's got a roll top desk and a grandfather clock upstairs they have a games table with a chessboard can you see that maggie the chessboard is uh, magnetic, so the men don't fall off, which is a nice feature. And they also have the living room here with matching furniture. Somebody took the trouble to make a fake newspaper and put it on the little ottoman here. They've got figurines and pillows and house plants and magazines. Underneath the step, there's a broom and a dustpan, a telephone under the steps, which I guess maybe is what people used to do and a spittoon and a washboard and wash tub. Really, the sky's the limit with this dollhouse. Think of the hours of fun you could have playing in that if you were Tom and Hunkamunka. And I'll show you the front of it, which is also quite nice. This could be your next project, Dad, if you're watching. Here's the house here at the front. They've got hanging plants and a hanging wind chime patio furniture. They've got wooden furniture up at the top. Some of the windows open. I don't think all of them do, but they all look really nice and a nice shingling job on top. Fairly steep pitch. This little detail up here with the shingles on the peak. So that's our dollhouse. I myself enjoyed making dollhouses out of stumps and things in the yard. But my daughter's generation and Heather, who you met at the beginning of this, were more accustomed to things like this. These are Heather's Polly Pockets. Polly Pockets were very popular. They were first introduced in, I believe, 1983. There's a third one there, but I, oh, I got her. Uh, I don't know what you did with this one, Heather, but she's got a wild head of hair. Oh, I, but she does have a comb, so she's working on it. And we have this Polly Pocket. And we have this Polly Pocket. Heather's got a huge collection of them. I'm only going to show you a few. Polly Pocket's obviously named for their size. They're small enough to be put in a pocket, I guess. But the Polly Pockets came with all kinds of house-like accessories. I'll show you this one first. This one is a shopping mall. This is the Polly Pocket shopping mall. It has a cafe. I believe that's the cafe that comes out. That part comes out and you can uh, get your sugars and creams for your coffee. It's got a clothing store with a try on folding table. It's got a salon and there's the rest of the salon. So I think Heather had quite a bit of fun playing with these, but she looked after it. It's in pretty good shape, Heather. And that's the Polly Pocket house. Quite a difference when compared to that fancy wooden one I just showed you. And then there's this one, if I can figure out how to open it. I didn't know what this was. I had to ask Heather what it was. Does anybody have a guess? Take a look at the details, and particularly the details on the door. And you might notice there's this here. If you guessed dog or pet salon, you are correct. So this was the Holly Hobbies pet salon. So they could come in and groom their dogs. Quite a different world than I grew up in, but I guess that's all right. Well, that's about all I have to talk about today. Hello. Uh, we do have uh, one question, which is uh, the dollhouse that you just showed. Do you think that it was made from like a kit or do you think that it was an original creation based on what it's looking like? It's hard to say. Um, it's hard to say because a lot of suppliers for dollhouses and things, they supply all their scale things. I don't know too much about this dollhouse. I did try to find out a little bit before I started this Facebook live, but um, 
I'm going to say it was, because I want it to be, I'm going to say it was homemade, but it may have been a kit. I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Um, can, is there a headline on the newspaper or does it have a name? Can you, can you make oh. it out? Let's see, Mickey's fetching it for me. Uh, yeah, it's the Chicago Daily Tribune. The headline says, millions go to the polls. Something streets over something. Oh, it looks like a, a tram ran over a police officer and killed him. Yeah, I can't see the date. It's too small. Here, oh, wow. That's kind of cool, though. It actually is completely filled it's out. It's not visible. So yeah, that's the answer. Alrighty. Um, oh, we've got another question. Mm -hmm. Which of the dolls that you've shown is your favorite? Oh, hands down, uh, the guy with the glasses. <laughs> Maggie's running to get him. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, and uh, Sleepy Sydney, that little mopey guy. You know, the one he's about this big with the hard head. I like this guy, the Shackman doll. I don't know, he's just got style. <laughs> he doesn't care that he's wearing velvet with tucked in pants and he's got a snappy hat. Doesn't care that he's got glasses and he's got nice little black shoes and Sleepy Sydney is my other favorite. He's just, I don't know, he's just really nice. He looks like he needs somebody to look after him. So yes, these are my two favorites of the ones that I've seen. Plus, I like the way Sydney's clothing are. He rolls like I do. No flies on Sydney. I like Sydney too. His feet kind of look like small potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's uh, all the questions that we have for now. So I think that'll about wrap us up. Right. Um, but thank you everyone for tuning in today and the video will be posted so you can watch it later if you missed it.